1992, three French teenage boys, Thomas Bangalter, Guy Manuel de Juan Cristo, and Laurent Brankovitz, formed a rock band named Darlin. After only releasing a few songs, they would garner arguably one of the most well-known negative music reviews of all time, in which the British weekly music magazine Melody Maker would call their only release a daft, punky thrash. After the group split, Laurent would re-emerge a few years later as a member of the band Phoenix, and Tomas and Guy Manuel would reinvent themselves into an electronic music duo named for their infamous review. This is how Daft Punk came into the world. Daft Punk, les punks timbrés. Les nouvelles coqueluches techno de l'Angleterre viennent de France et cassent la baraque. In the transformation from rock band to what some media proclaim to be the new wave of the new wave, Daft Punk had to dive deep into the most recent evolutions in dance music. This saw them traveling to the club scene in New York City, partying with underground subcultures, predominantly occupied by queer black and Latino artists, who were spearheading the subgenre known as house. Mostly originating in the black and gay music scene in Chicago, House was a kind of successor to disco. Its working class creators used samples and mixing techniques to fill in the gaps where top of the line recording equipment and studio time was just inaccessible. While disco had been partially chased out of broader American culture in an ugly backlash, France's long standing warm connection with the genre made it a welcome environment for House to thrive alongside it. Through their fascination with learning Chicago's newest musical invention, Daft Punk would import its sound to their home country. Tomas and Manuel had undergone major reinvention to become the now near-mythical act that was Daft Punk. They achieved this through passion and privilege. Tomas and Guy-Manuel were from well-off families, having met at the Lycée Carnot Secondary School in Paris, an institution known for educating a number of famous Frenchmen and hosting runways for the city's prestigious fashion week. Guy-Manuel's French lineage was a product of the exile of his great-great-grandfather, Portuguese fascist Francisco Manuel Homem Cristo, though he takes no pride in this connection. Tomas was the son of Daniel Vanguard, a French disco producer with both the connections and musical knowledge to give his son a head start in the field. Both were given instruments from a young age to hone their skills, and Tomas began lessons at age six under the tutelage of a musician from the Paris Opera. It cannot be overstated how blessed Daft Punk was in what their financial comforts, education, and connections enabled them to do. The two met on a school trip to Pompeii, began to create music together as children, and later began the rock band life with Darlin. After deciding to pivot to dance music, Daniel Vanguard provided his son with gifts of both material support and insight as an industry pro, so much so that he is credited in the booklet for Daft Punk's debut album, Homework. For his 18th birthday in 1994, Tomas was able to purchase the equipment necessary to truly begin his venture into electronic music by way of a gift of $1,500 from Vanguard. The two were able to learn from the DJs who wrote the blueprint for House via international trips to America. They had the luxury of a hospitable space in Tomas's home to plug away at their newfound craft. Bronkovitz recounts that, in his youth as their friend, Tomas's wealth was shown in his ability to purchase a new record every single day. This was a habit that endowed him with a vast library to draw from, both as an artist and a cultural student. I don't introduce these facts to imply that Daft Punk had their success handed to them. Far from it. Daft Punk was a pair of two capable, versatile artists who diligently worked their creative zeal to create some of the most well-known dance music in the genre's history. The French take on house music is known globally largely because of them. Though there's been debate, my particular position as a fan is that they're among the most brilliant creators of their generation. Their privilege was just the key that allowed them to open the door, and it gave them the ability to pursue far-flung projects many aspiring musicians could only imagine. What may be more interesting still is the fact that, despite their privilege and comfort from birth, or maybe because of it, neither Guy Manuel nor Tomas seemed interested in pursuing music to chase financial gain, or at least not solely because of it. In the entirety of Daft Punk's career, one through line becomes apparent. They made art for passion above all else. Their only goal was to make what was compelling to them interesting to them. In their history as a duo, Daft Punk released only four studio albums from 1997 to 2013. 
Their music history also includes the score from the 2010 film Tron Legacy, two live albums, and a handful of remix and compilation releases. For a music act, Daft Punk's discography is just one small chunk of their artistic portfolio. Daft Punk was more than just music. It was a multimedia project, an experiment in transformative art with music at the roots of the tree. Tomas has said as much. Through these, these waves, the only thing maybe is, is that it's true that from the start, uh, our approach has been really a global uh, b b b from a creative standpoint and, 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 and not just purely musical and, and people maybe it, it took a little bit of time for people to understand that and, and, and thinking that there would there would it was maybe music with with some uh, <coughs> people would see it maybe with mu music with a very clever marketing around or something like that but but it was not, it was not that at all and, and we really focused on on expressing ourselves and expanding uh, this creation from um, music and, and tracks and 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 then working on uh, DVD or music music different music videos at the time or or, or a, a Japanese animation film or a film or, or a tour and and, and with uh, all of these elements um, being as important or a full part of what we're doing uh, and, and and not just about okay with it's you know 15 years down the line we've done three albums and our studio albums and that's it and 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 looking at all of these elements and and and, and taking the time to work on all these different sides of, of the project because uh, it's really in this combination of all these um all these art forms and that we thought that there was an opportunity for us to to express something that would maybe go beyond a musical trend their desire to go beyond the borders of music was apparent from their first release homework yielded a series of interconnected music videos that as a collective were known as daft a story about dogs, androids, firemen, and tomatoes. The hour-long project consisted of the music videos for homework cuts Da Funk, Around the World, Burnin', Revolution 909, Fresh, and Rollin' and Scratchin', which make up about one-third of the album's track list. Directors for the project included a number of auteurs who were either already prolific or whose stars were on the rise. Spike Jones, Michel Gondry, Roman Coppola, French photographer Seb Jania, and Daft Punk themselves. The videos are exactly what the title dictates, the story of an anthropomorphic dog named Charles as he navigates life in New York City. It's vague and weird, and Bangalter himself has said that there's less meaning to it than critics might suggest. But it was their vision, and it was completed. Michel Gondry's Around the World is arguably the most ubiquitous of all, with a somewhat avant-garde music video where each element of the song is represented by a different group of costume characters, moving on one platform in one room. A high-definition version of the video has about 50 million views on YouTube as of this writing. It was uploaded in October of 2021. Daft was perhaps the first indication that Daft Punk was indeed more than just music. It was the adventure of two creative minds exploring their depths, picking out the bits that invited the most energy and passion, and committing to bringing them to life. Budgets and sales and focus testing, meaning basically nothing along the way. They were poised to create at their own pace, to their own wishes. Tomas gave away the thesis to their creative goals yet again in an April 2001 interview, days after their sophomore album Discovery was released. To be free, we had to be in control. To be in control, we had to finance what we were doing ourselves. The main idea was to be free. Discovery, in many ways, was an explosive era for Daft Punk's artistic image. Almost literally. The success of Homework had thrust Tomas and Guy Manuel into a level of fast, invasive fame that neither of them were interested in or wanted. After a handful of standard interviews at the very start of their career, the two began to come up with creative ways to hide their faces in press and publicity materials. After shuffling through methods like masks, they began their next era by debuting a permanent way of obscuring their likeness, taking on the personas of robots. There's an internal mythology to Daft Punk's robot identity. According to them, a freak explosion at their studio rendered them mostly machine. Tomas was in silver, and Guy Manuel in gold. This became the defining aspect of their artistic image, one they would carry with them in varying forms until their breakup. 
This was yet another example of their artistic commitment. The robot helmets were a huge undertaking, with many different models made by different craftspeople to suit their needs over different album cycles. Different helmets, including internal communication devices for live shows and LED displays. This was all a necessary investment to them. Once again, their values and desires were top priority. Discovery was a monumental achievement for the newly christened robots. While it was a respectable success at the time, granting them a few hits that would be in party playlist rotations for years to come, its legacy has elevated it to near-mythic heights. It usually sits around the midway point of the Rolling Stone 500 Greatest Albums list, and Pitchfork revised their review of it in 2021 to raise its score to a perfect 10. While many music acts are pushed to produce at a borderline unreasonable pace to retain public favor before the new fad comes along, Tomas and Guy-Manuel took over four years to follow up on the success of Homework. They had the luxury of taking time. But Discovery was, naturally, not just about the songs. The album had been crafted as a soundtrack to a rock opera about what the two saw as the creative destruction within the recording industry. After floating a live-action pitch with filmmakers including Daft director Spike Jones and hitting roadblocks, they decided to go animated. Their lofty ambitions led them to seek collaboration with legendary manga artist Leiji Matsumoto, a childhood hero of theirs, and he accepted the offer. Over the course of about three years, the two artistic powerhouses would work together to craft an animated science fiction feature known as Interstellar 4 5, with its only soundscape effectively being Discovery from its first note. To its final fade out. Interstellar was basically a time and money sink. It didn't get a wide release in any theaters. It only aired on television in its first four segments on Cartoon Network's Toonami block. It was released in full nearly three years after Discovery's debut, released alongside the Daft Club remix album. The film cost millions to make, and was a lush visual work that, for all its obscurity, had a profound impact on a lot of the people who viewed it. The pattern had been established. Daft Punk would go on to enter each new era with a deluge of creative projects that made the albums just one piece of a broader tapestry. Not long after their third album, Human After All, they would write and direct the science fiction feature Electroma, with characters based on their robotic alter egos undergoing an adventure to seek humanity and purpose. Around the same time, their Alive 2007 World Tour would shake the table of live entertainment by bringing together a critically acclaimed DJ set remixing their own work with a visual spectacle where the two played their songs inside of a now iconic pyramid set piece. They would form the Daft Club fan community online in the infancy of the internet. Tomas would lead the charge on molding the French house subgenre with his label, Roulette, helping to craft the summertime dance hit, Music Sounds Better With You, as a part of the group Stardust. Guy Manuel would own a label of his own, named Crydemore, where he'd be in his own side group called La Night Club. The sheer scope of their projects while still being Daft Punk was staggering. But even before their status as legends was cemented, they seemed to only ever play by their own rules, with their own toys. They engaged in a series of collaborations with The Weeknd. They scored Tron, then remixed the score. While recording their fourth and final album, Random Access Memories, they insisted on working alongside their childhood heroes once again. Heroes that were often underappreciated in the mainstream culture of the 2010s, because they treasured their impact. They employed recording methods that they knew no one but them might ever fully appreciate. The album won the coveted Album of the Year trophy at the Grammys, alongside every other category it was nominated in. And each time they rose to the microphone in robot regalia and didn't say a single word. Though it must be said, their joy was unmistakable. And then... A few years after what seemed like their highest high, with rumors still floating around about new music that never materialized, it was over. After nearly three decades together, electro legends Daft Punk have split up. They formed in 1993, releasing their debut album Homework a few years later. Along with in February 2021, they announced their split. Daft Punk had always had an almost alarmingly prescient grasp of the cultural tides, whether it was the incoming chaos of the streaming era and music in the early 2000s, or the unifying potential of the internet. In 2021, it seemed like everyone was plugged in, becoming a little robotic, and Tomas and Guy Manuel, their fingers still pressed to the pulse, knew they wanted to cut their wires down. 
And while their massive impact left many mourning a globally known dance duo, their most devoted fans saw beyond their most visible achievements. The end of Daft Punk meant that the curtain was falling on not just one of the most famous DJ pairs, but the minds beyond Electroma, the writers of Interstellar, the robots in the pyramid. But this is all a very long, roundabout way to explain one vital thing. Those things only got to exist. Daft Punk only got to create at their own whims, because fate had been random and kind to them. Their talent and skill were and are enormous, and their success is their own doing. But they were allowed to reach the heights they did because Tomas and Guy Manuel didn't have to worry about getting the next album out to pay the rent, or making sure their films made their budget back, or finding time to mix songs between two day jobs. Their privileges spared them from the cruelty of the grind that separates culture from thousands of voices whose genius never sees the light of day. As straight white men from the upper echelon of Parisian society, Tomas and Guy Manuel were always guests in the house of… well, house. The homework track Teachers consists of them listing off the dozens of musicians who taught them how to create dance music through their work. And almost all of them are black and Latino DJs, predominantly from Chicago, where House was born. Most of these musicians would never see the level of fame that Daft Punk achieved, and yet Daft Punk is probably nothing without them. Is it fair that the likes of DJ Rush and Mike Dearborn and Paris Mitchell, who laid the groundwork for the genre that many would name Daft Punk the kings of, don't get a fraction of the money, or honor, or acclaim from the mainstream public? Most would say no. For all my love and admiration for Daft Punk, it feels bitterly ironic that a genre whose signature sound was DIY disco by those who couldn't afford studio time at Electric Lady is often assigned to two men who were able to carve their niche with help from inherited wealth and knowledge. For every Tomas Bangalter who has the opportunity to unleash his most daring and esoteric creative ambitions into our culture, there are hundreds of the same caliber whose fame begins and ends in the nightclubs of their zip code. There are thousands more whose work gets suffocated by the graveyard shift, and by the price tag on the Yamaha keyboard, and by the whims of executives demanding cultural hegemony, because risk doesn't always recoup. This might sound like I'm trying to discredit Daft Punk. To the contrary, I think Daft Punk represents what our culture ought to aspire to for artists, which is the space, wherewithal, and freedom to create boldly, uniquely, and without the threat of poverty. While Daft Punk was immensely successful in the broader landscape, many of their projects have become niche trivia pieces, only really known by their fiercest fans. Yes, millions of people have seen the video for Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger, but how many of them can tell you the plot to Interstellar, let alone purchased it on Blu-ray? How many people know Electroma even exists? Daft Punk only embarked on two tours in their entire career, and released official merchandise so rarely that what little there is goes for inflated resale prices online. Even in the two most financially viable methods for money making in the music business, they largely ignored in favor of pursuing what they wanted to do, making things that have a sliver of a fraction of the mainstream impact of, like, Get Lucky's chart run. But does that make those creations worthless? Hardly. Maybe few people have seen Interstellar, but many of the people who did cite it as a hugely influential piece of art to them. And that's the thing, good art does not necessarily mean financially successful art, and vice versa. But it seems like there's precious little room for that impactful art that doesn't rake in the cash. Even now, after their breakup, the two have taken it slow. Tomas recently scored a ballet. Guy Manuel, the far more private of the two, has been minding his own business. They have the luxury of their own pace. They've never taken it for granted. We see the fingerprints of the need to survive in art throughout history, but it's maybe most apparent in the current moment. Small-scale original stories get displaced at theaters by big-budget, repetitive franchise blockbusters. Daring books from new voices get moved off the shelf for piles of tropes decided by committees at Monopoly publishing houses. Music is often being shrunk down and cropped into bite-sized bits for the sake of going viral. And it's hard to fault creators for taking the quote-unquote easy way to succeed. 
The alternative, following your vision to your exact preferences, is often not financially viable, and we all need to survive. Daft Punk provides a glimpse into what we could have if we didn't have to fight to make it through the week, to keep a roof over our heads, to keep food accessible, and the creative freedom there would be if art didn't have to be lucrative. At the 2014 Grammy Awards, Daft Punk performed Get Lucky with Pharrell, Nile Rodgers, and Stevie Wonder, plus bassist Nathan East and drummer Omar Hakim. The entire crowd was on its feet. Tomas and Guy Manuel donned specially made white versions of their robot costumes, positioned in the very back of the stage, and only visibly showing up halfway through the performance, while their legendary collaborators stood in the spotlight. The song launched into a medley, alternating between a number of Daft Punk's hits, followed by Stevie Wonder's Another Star, and interspersed with callbacks to Sheik's hit song, The Freak. The energy was electric. The surviving Beatles, Katy Perry, Beyonce and Jay-Z, Bruno Mars, Keith Urban, John Legend, some of music's biggest and longest burning stars were all dancing together with almost 30 million more people at home watching the Song of the Summer explode to life on stage. And at the end, all these cultural icons stood together and applauded as the robots stood and applauded in turn for their colleagues. This was the culmination of Tomas and Guy Manuel spending years not wasting their chance at what I think we all deserve a life with the freedom to create what brings us joy. We can only wonder what the world might be like if every mind had the freedom of Daft Punk. We can only fantasize about that world where every DJ with a day job in Chicago's South Side, every painter working the night shift to afford canvases in Johannesburg, or every poet living paycheck to paycheck in London, had their chance to run at their boldest visions without the distraction of potential poverty on their tail. But I think it's still not too late to make that fantasy our reality. Maintenant, on arrive à une époque où l'industrie musicale elle est ouverte à tous. Il faut que tout le monde se lance là-dedans parce qu'on a trop eu l'habitude d'avoir des, 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 des produits, des produits finis de merde qui nous cassent les couilles, mais pas trop. Time has come to make a decision. Are we in this thing alone? Or are we in it together?